Hi everyone. This is our second lecture on organizational perspectives on work and family issues. We'll talk a little bit about formal benefits as a continuation of last week's lecture, but mostly we'll move on to talking about the informal environment of the organization. Before we dig into that, I want to touch um, on the specifications for this online lecture. They're a little bit different than last time. So I have four discussion board questions posted for you, and you need to respond to them by Friday, November 27th at midnight. Okay. Before I gave you, I think, six questions and you only had to respond to four, now I just have four and you need to respond to each of them. The first question does require you to, to discuss some of the, the findings from your homework assignment. Recall that was supposed to be due November 23rd. I gave you an extension so you don't have to turn it in until class on November 30th which I may have said in class that you can email it to me. Please just bring it to class that day on November 30th. I think that's the easiest. Um, but you will need to have at least started it or done a little research for it to answer discussion board question one. So I just want you to keep that in mind as you're working on your timing uh, for you know the week and figuring everything out. So I'll also post this uh, as an announcement on Blackboard so that you're not caught by surprise when you read this. But you do need to have a little bit of insight to, to answer discussion board question one. And then I'm um, asking you to respond to, to three of your classmates' comments, and that needs to be done by Wednesday, December 2nd. So we'll meet in class on November 30th, um, but you'll still have time after that. I'm just giving you an extended time period due to the holidays. Okay, so here's the first discussion board question. Last week in class, we talked a lot about formal benefits, right? We went through and talked about flexible benefits and, and some research that shows how efficacious they are in terms of helping with work-family conflict. Um, you know, the, seems like they may be a little bit overhyped in terms of the research doesn't seem to show a clear connection with work-family conflict, although there is a connection with other favorable things, some, such as some job attitudes and um, turnover. We also talked about dependent care supports. Um, but there's been a lot less research on those, right? And we went through and talked about the prevalence of how much they've been offered in the United States, at least based on the uh, National Study of Employers from the Family Work Institute. So in your homework, you looked at three different companies. You came up with seven dimensions, I think it was seven, that you feel are important that makes an organization family friendly. So just essentially would, would typically open this class with a discussion about what you found and you know, what was particularly interesting or surprising. So I'd like to try to emulate that in a discussion board format. So it's basically just want you to comment on, on the assignment. I gave you some specific ideas to consider if you feel like you want a little bit more direction in your commenting. Um, so one might be, how did your dimensions map onto what the company's actually offered? Is there a benefit that you expected one or maybe more of these companies to have or not have that they did or did not? Um, and then you can also speak about working mother's criteria if you think that actually is good criteria to use to define what are the top companies for, um, for working mothers. All right, so go ahead and either you, know, you can do that now and pause the lecture or come back and make sure you fill in that discussion board one by Friday. So again, as we discussed last week, it's hard to c jump to the conclusion that benefits are going to be the be-all, end-all of solving people's work-family problems, right? Uh, they're not actually clearly linked to reducing at least work-family conflict. So that suggests that it's more than just the benefits um, that are important. And I should say also, we didn't explicitly mention this last week, but when you look at meta-analyses of uh, studies that look at flexible work arrangements in relation to work family conflict, there's a lot of heterogeneity in effect sizes. So what I mean by that is when you're combining all these various studies, it's not that they're all finding a zero relationship. Some are finding that it really helps work family conflict, some are finding that it doesn't help at all, some are finding that it hurts. So it just means that there's a lot of variation in what you find across studies. And what that typically points to is the idea that there's something else at play. It's called moderator effects. So that means that it, it depends, right? The association between having flexibility and work family conflict depends on third or maybe fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, tons of other factors that are at play, right? It's very conditional on situational or maybe even individual contexts. One of those contexts that's really important 
um, is the culture or climate of the organization. So you've read the chapter that I co-authored with some colleagues about this. Um, I'm going to use the term culture and climate interchangeably. Um, I, there are some subtle differences as we point out in the chapter, but I don't think they're particularly meaningful and a lot of times people use culture when they refer to what I think the definition of climate is more closely aligned with. So um, in, your, in your test or in your discussions of this, I think it's fine to use them interchangeably. But the basic ideas that we're getting at, um, so this, this climate, this is the definition of climate actually, is this relatively enduring quality of the environment. Okay, so people recognize it, it influences their behavior, um, you can look at the values um, or sort of attributes of the environment to pick up on it. So that's a very abstract definition. Uh, which brings us to the question of how do you actually diagnose an organization's culture? So that's not an easy question, right? We kind of know, you can you have a feeling of what the culture of any place that you work is, but if someone were to come in from the outside and say, okay, we want to figure out how to describe this culture, it wouldn't be such an easy process. So it kind of takes some time to really understand the dynamics of it. Um, it's a complicated issue, but it's nonetheless really, really important, okay, because it can research on organizational culture extends much much broader than work family research but in this specific realm we can think about it it really can have effects of undermining the offering of formal benefits in terms of of not making them actually usable for people and not as beneficial so we'll talk a little more broadly about culture in general and then we'll move into talking about work family culture um, so here are some ways that you can diagnose culture you have to look, because it's this invisible concept, you have to turn to, well, what is visible that we can actually measure and use to infer things about culture? And the two main ways are through what are called artifacts and then behavior. So artifacts are thought to be sort of these remnants that illustrate something about culture. So there's some examples here. So think about employee dress. If you go into an organization where everyone is dressed in business attire, right? Everyone's wearing suits and ties. Um, that gives you a sense this is a very formal place versus if you go into typical startup culture where people are wearing jeans and t-shirts and there's no dress code at all. That alone is communicating something to you about the nature of that climate or culture, right? Uh, another one that really stands out would be the interior architecture. Same idea there, you may have a company that's very, very nicely decorated. And you can tell they spend a lot of money on their interiors. We may have a place like Walmart, for instance. Walmart headquarters, their offices are very bare bones. Right? They have cement floors, actually, in the offices. Um, they have no art on the walls or anything like that because that aligns with Walmart's culture, right? Their whole brand is to try to save money and to be a very cheap retailer. So it, it doesn't seem fitting that they would have these very elegant offices because that would just cost more and, and would take away from the savings and the, and the low cost, which is their entire identity. Um, so you, that's a, an example, too, of where the, the product line or the, uh, the goal of the business can often be tied really closely with the culture. Okay. Um, so you can just look for, for these artifacts. We think about an anthropologist coming in. You know, artifacts is a word we often associate with, with anthropology, but it can be used in, in present-day situations, right? It, it's just looking for any evidence that we can piece together a puzzle and make assumptions about what that communicates about culture. Um, behaviors are very similar. You know, one thing you might pick up on employee training, if, if very little training is given, that signals that this is not a culture that's really into developing employees. Okay. On the other hand, if there's lots of different training programs, you might draw the opposite conclusion that it's a, a very employee-centric culture. Um, recycling programs, that might communicate something about how much they, they care about corporate social responsibility, at least as it's aligned with the environment in that sense. So moving then um, more specifically, um, talk a little bit about giving you examples of cultures. So you can also talk about cultures in terms of there's different types of cultures, um, which we won't go into because I think it's a little bit divergent from this lecture and, and these typologies aren't really that useful because cultures are so unique. Um, but you can also talk about weak and strong cultures. So that means that the culture is very, very clear. In a strong culture, it's, it's having a bigger impact on people than in a weak culture. So those artifacts are probably going to be much stronger, those behaviors. You're going to see 
uh, less heterogeneity across people in an organization. A strong culture makes people act really very similarly in the same way. So I have two videos here to show you, um, showing two strong cultures uh, from Zappos and Amazons, but Amazon, but two cultures that are really very distinct despite both being strong. So the first one is Zappos. Zappos.com. Sales associates, dressed as barmaids. How's everyone doing? Are you being safe? Spider-Man in the cafeteria. Go. Racing toy cars in the middle of the office. What's going on here? Welcome to the zoo. What you are witnessing is a social experiment by Tony Shea, the entrepreneur and mastermind behind Zappos the online shoe company. His revolutionary way of running a business has made Zappos into a $1.2 billion powerhouse. And he got there with the guiding principle, great things will happen if you make employees happy. It's like a playground. I mean, there are balloons, there are whistles. Does that help business? We think it's important for employees to have fun and that drives employee engagement and companies with strong cultures tend to outperform the ones that don't have strong cultures. Shea's hugely successful company sells over a thousand brands of shoes in just about every style, size, and color. Ship 24 hours a day, as many as you like, and it's free shipping both ways. At Zappos headquarters in Henderson, Nevada, outside of Las Vegas, no dour corporate cubicles here. Instead, employees are cheerful and downright zany. And no CEO corner office. Instead, Tony Shea sits in the middle in his own cubicle next to his assistant. You want your people you hire to be, in your words, a little weird. What does that mean? One of our core values is to create fun and a little weirdness. We really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality. We want their true personality to shine in the workplace. Tony Shea has been a maverick from an early age, the son of Taiwanese parents with high expectations. My parents wanted me to get good grades and eventually become a lawyer or a doctor. But Tony launched his own little rebellion before he hit double digits. Your parents wanted you to learn uh, musical instruments, but you deceived them. What did you do? I really did not enjoy playing musical instruments, so I would play recordings of me playing the piano while my parents were still in bed, so they thought I was practicing. Do you play any instruments today? Yeah, I can pretend to. Shay began to show an instinct for business at just nine years old. I had this idea of buying a lot of worms, and then I would grow my own, and then I could eventually sell worms. What happened? Maybe a week or two later, all the worms had escaped. So that was the end of my worm farm business. Good grades got him into all the top universities, but he went with his parents' choice, Harvard. You didn't go to any classes. How come you still got A's? Reading the material on my own or getting notes from friends. Is it true that one of your courses was Mandarin Chinese, but you already spoke Mandarin Chinese? Yes, it was first year Mandarin Chinese. I don't know whether we should be very proud of you or whether you're going to tell young people, you know, go to college and never go to school. I actually encourage them to take the money they would have spent on college to uh, start businesses instead, if your ultimate goal is to be an entrepreneur. Not one to let college get in the way of commerce, Shay made fast money selling fast food. Got on the subway, went one stop, bought frozen uh, McDonald's burgers, took a taxi back and cooked them and sold them to students. How much money did you make? Five or ten thousand dollars. After graduating, Shay's first big move was launching an advertising website from his basement called Link Exchange. It grew quickly. But so did Tony's unhappiness. As it got more successful, that's when you didn't want to do it anymore. Why not? It wasn't a fun place to work at anymore. So you sold it. How much did you get when you sold Link Exchange? $265 million. He was set for life, but then someone approached him with the idea of selling shoes online. You said it sounded like the poster child of bad internet ideas. You were not interested in shoes. 
I'm actually still not interested in shoes. It was the most exciting business from a growth perspective, and I really like the people there. Shay jumped on board as CEO, and this time, he would build his company differently. But I definitely do not want to repeat the same mistake I had made at my previous company, where the company culture just went downhill. If I was going to go into an office every day, might as well go into an office with people I would choose to be around, not be around purely just for business reasons. Shay is evangelical about making sure his employees are happy, offering free food in the cafeteria, covering all medical benefits, and even supplying a life coach to help employees reach their goals. I just was accepted to the brand marketing internship. Oh, that is awesome. That is great. Congratulations. Fortune magazine named Zappos one of the top 10 companies to work for. There's some rowdy folks. Feel free to take pictures and video as we go around. And the business world is taking notice. Don't mind the silly string folks. It's superhero week. Employees from other companies often show up at Zappos headquarters, taking tours and trying to understand what makes Zappos so successful, often with disbelief. I think they think we're nuts. I think people are generally afraid to allow employees to be themselves because then they feel like the power is taken away. It's really more than just a place to work. It's, it's a lifestyle. Most Zappos employees, when they leave the office, leave to hang out with other Zappos employees. It, not because we force them to, but because they actually choose to. After a decade, Zappos dominated the online shoe industry, and it has expanded into other products. And last year, Amazon bought the company for $1.2 billion, but asked Shea to stay on as CEO. He agreed for a salary of just $36,000 a year. That's my way of making sure that I'm actually only there for my own happiness, that I'm not staying for the money. Shea is not proprietary about how he runs his business. In fact, he put Zappos' recipe for success in a book called Delivering Happiness and went on tour to spread the word. Shay's next big project is to deliver happiness to downtown Las Vegas. We are in the Fremont East District right now. It's an area that most... Okay, I think that gives you a good sense of Zappos. So a couple things to pay attention to there. First of all, you can pick up on their culture is um, much more relaxed, right? They want people... He's really big on work being fun. Imagine that, right? Um, and he's very big on who he hires. So I've, I've read the book that they just mentioned there, and he talks a lot more about this, where they really want the workplace to be like people he would like to hang out with. So that can be a positive and a negative. I mean, it's, it's nice in a sense, it's probably easier to work with people you like, but that could create some narrow-mindedness if you have people who are too similar in an organization. It's very easy to make bad decisions. That's where the concept of groupthink that, that some of you have taken introduction to psychology may have heard of. It's when groups make really bad decisions because they're too similar and they don't have anyone that really brings up uh, multiple points of view or dissenting opinions. So there is some danger in that. Um, but ultimately, he does a lot of things to make it to be a good place to work where you know, people want to go there. Something else that they do that's really unique is they have, um, once you get hired, you go to this, I think it's a month or two weeks but training, and they pay for that, and at the, you, know, you get paid your, your salary already at that point, and then at the end of the training, they say, okay, you know what our company's all about. If you want to leave, we'll pay you $2,000 to quit. So that what the idea behind that is, is they're paying people, they want you right now. If you realize after going through the training that you're not going to be a good fit with this company, then they want you to leave sooner rather than later. Um, so it seems like, wow, $2,000 to quit. You might think a lot of people would do that because Heck, they get $2,000, no strings attached, but actually the base rate of people who take it is incredibly low. And I think they just, uh, I read something where they actually are talking about increasing it to even more money. Cause, so they really want people who want to work at the company. I'm sorry, again, I apologize for the, the loudness outside. Um, the other thing that stands out to me is that it, you can see that the founders of companies often have a huge impact on the culture. All right, so it starts with the founders and then over time, you know, it trickles down to the senior leadership. So they're, they're really big in, in setting the stage for culture in general and work family culture specifically that we'll get to in a minute. Last thing you notice at the end there that I mentioned they, they just, and this is a couple years old now, but a couple years on this concept of culture. 
Um, so you can think about specific types of culture. Work family culture is just one of them. Others are, um, and again, it's sometimes called climate. So diversity climate, safety culture or climate, those are the big ones. So thompson bovan Linus, which is probably the most widely accepted definition of work family culture, is a shared assumptions, beliefs, and values regarding the extent to which an organization supports and values the integration of work and family lives. As you read in the chapter, there's there are several dimensions of this. So Thompson, and actually Cindy Thompson is um, here in Cooney, as is Karen Linus, two of the authors on this piece. They, in their original work, came up with what they said was three dimensions that typify a supportive culture. So that's being that your direct manager is supportive, or managers in general are supportive of people's work-family balance, that there aren't negative career repercussions associated with using any of those formal benefits that we discussed last week, and that time demands are reasonable, so you're not expected to be there 100 hours a week. Of course, reasonable is a subjective term. Other people have added different ideas to this, maybe even managers willing to discuss or let their employees know about benefits, and this extends not just to benefits to the organization, but also benefits that are available through um, state or federal legislation. So thinking back to last week, I showed you that data that some 20-some percent of companies are not in compliance with FMLA, so that could be an issue where the companies know that they they should be offering those, but they're not disclosing that necessarily to employees who, not knowing, um, don't ask about it. Just f flat out offering flexibility as a specific type of benefit, um, giving resources in general uh, for work-life issues, and not placing a lot of value on being physically present at the workplace, focusing more on actually getting things done versus where and when they're got they are completed. And then other people have talked about supporting fathers, so that's supposed to be an indication. A lot of companies understand the challenge that mothers have, but companies who are actually supportive of fathers are extending that to all their employees, and that seemed to be, you know, if you're supportive of fathers, you're likely also very supportive of mothers, too. Tammy Allen did some work on this as well, where she just took a unidimensional approach. So she argued that Thompson's work confounded a couple different things. So they, they argue that managerial support is really important. That's at the managerial level, um, so how could that really reflect the overall culture of an organization? Where the other two, you know, maybe, maybe within your department, but are broader than just your specific manager. So Alan argued there's some, some levels of analysis problems there. So her concept is just called Family Supportive Organization Perceptions. It moves beyond this idea of culture. It just says it depends on how much the individual person perceives their organization to be supportive of them. So she argues that people in the same, working in the same um, department, even in the same job, could vary a lot on these perceptions since it is an individual perception. Whereas the culture idea is supposed to be, as is in, written in the definition, a shared assumption across people. So there are some differences there that are meaningful, although they're generally kind of getting at the same notion of helping people with their work family concerns. Uh, so I, I want to show you the, the items from the Allen et al. scale. This is the one that I personally prefer, um, partially because Tammy Allen was my advisor in graduate school. Um, also, I think it, it's uh, overcome some of the issues that we just talked about with the levels of analysis. So fix this typo here. Um, so here are the items. There's 14 questions. So you're supposed to think about the philosophy or beliefs of your organization, how much you, each statement aligns with that. So it's not your beliefs, but if you're answering on behalf of your organization, what would you say? So what I want you to do is to take a minute and actually complete this scale. Uh, I think most of you work, so if you don't work, uh, there's going to be a discussion question on this. Um, you know, I think you can just think about a past job that you have. If you've never had a job, then you're quite lucky and um, let me know. We can figure out an alternative question for you here. But I think most of you should be able to answer this pretty easily thinking about your current organization. All right. So go through. I'm going to give you a minute here um, and, and to keep this uh, these items up. Just jot down on a piece of paper your whether you strongly disagree or agree using this one through five rating scale.
Again, this is what you think, the philosophy of your organization, not your own beliefs. So, my organization believes that work should be the primary priority in a person's life. Okay, so if you need a little bit more time to do this, you can just pause um, the video. Um. Okay, so now I'll pull up Tammy uh, Allen's study and show you some data from the actual study. So you will notice that with several of the items listed here, there's an R after them. That means that these are reverse scored items. So. Typically, the higher that you score, if, if we're, we have a scale that's telling us the higher you score on it, the more supportive or the greater family supportive organization perception someone perceives. But some of these items tell you the opposite, right? So work should be a primary priority in a person's life. Well, that's the higher you score on that, that's actually probably not indicative of an organization being family supportive. So we have to flip that item. So the way that you flip it is um, think of like a, a mirror, if you wrote out that one, two, three, four, five, pull that back up. Think about a mirror being right here on three, okay? So if you put a one before, now the mirror is going to make it appear like a five. If you put a two, it should be changed to a four. You, we don't change the three. You put a four, it'd be changed to the two. A five, it would be changed to the one. So go ahead and go through your responses to these 14 items, and for those that are reverse scored, which includes question 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 14, so a lot are reverse scored in this, any of those items with an R, you want to change the 1 to a 5, 2 to a 4, 4 to a 2, and 5 to a 1. So you can do that and pause this video until you finish that. So now once you've reversed them all, you can see you can compare your score to the average across the hundreds of people that were in this study. Alright, so for number one, the means of 3.16. After reverse scoring, if you had a two, that means it, that for that question, you're falling below the mean. So you're, you're perceiving your organization as less supportive, at least on that question, than the average person. Okay, and you can interpret it like that all through all the items. Um, another way to do it that I think is a little bit more meaningful is to take your score on all of the 14 items, add it up, so you're going to have 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2, right? Um, and then divide by 14. So again, pause this video and give your chances, yourself a chance to do that. So you should have some average that's between numbers 1 and 5. Um, the, I computed the average across all these items based on um, the averages presented here, and that is 3.21. So your company may, you may perceive your company as higher or lower than that. That gives you a sense of kind of where you stand relative to the average person. Higher meaning you think your company is more family supportive, lower meaning you think they're less. So, so that brings us to our... Second discussion question, um, I just want you to comment about on how, not, it's not really your organization, I guess it's your perceptions of your organization, but where did you fall on the scale? 
Um, were you surprised about where you fell with regard to the averages of other people? Right? Does and maybe another thing to add on to this would be, you know, does it does this seem to reflect sort of how you would anecdotally have talked about your company without completing this quantitative measure? All right, so you can again do that now and pause this or come back and do it later. So I think that's something uh, related to this debate about is it just an individual's perceptions or is there really this idea of a, a shared assumption with the culture. Um, c this can be addressed somewhat empirically. So um, this was mentioned in the chapter, but I know it's not exactly the, the clearest concept, so I'm going to try to walk through it. So what I have drawn here is, let's say, people from two different organizations, the blue organization and the pink organization. Now. People in the blue organization can be grouped there in three different departments. So that would be the little um, rounded edges squares are representing the departments. And then within each department you have, you know, five people. Obviously this is simplified from a big true organization structure. So if there really was this shared assumption, we should expect that the people respond similarly on questionnaires, right? Maybe there'd be some differences. We'd expect the people in the, the the department to be the most similar, right? So in the the lightest blue group, it's probably going to be more similar in their responses to people in the darker blue, as well as the middle shade blue. Um, but if it's at the organizational level, we should still expect a good amount of congruence. And then we would expect we could take to the organizational level. We should expect people in the organization on the left, the blue organization they're going to be more similar, more alike than they would be to people in the pink or purple organization on the right. And so that's just, if, if that's a true cultural variable, we should accept, expect, expect to see the variation to play out in that manner. And this is something you can test through what's called an interclass coefficient. So I won't go into a lot of details with that, but studies have done this so they've had people embedded in these different groups and um, they've compared to see what well, we should expect again if it's truly shared culture there should be a lot of similarity um, and the ICC values that show how much is shared are really low All right, it's only 3 to 11 percent um, it's kind of shared across people within the same department or the same organization that's a really low number so I think what that communicates is that it's probably, it's hard to argue that it's a shared assumption, right? So this, calling it a culture may be a little bit misleading. There's certainly something to this idea of people who have different perceptions about how supportive their organization is, and that impacts a lot of outcomes. Um, but I, I just don't know if it operates on this shared assumption cultural level, like the original Thompson um, et al. paper would have us believe. But again, that's not that's not to denigrate the basic idea that these these um, beliefs matter. And I'll show you some data. Okay, so this is some data from the original study by Thompson and colleagues. So they measured all kinds of things in the study through a survey. They asked people um, about their perceptions of the work family culture based on items from those three dimensions discussed earlier, and then they correlated those with the use of family work family benefits as well as some attitudes. Um, they found the better you thought the culture was in terms of supporting work family, the more likely you were to use available benefits, and the more committed you were to your organization, the less likely you were to turn over or intend to turn over, I should say. And then finally, the, the lower work family conflict you reported. Um, but the real key finding is that they, they looked at the strength of associations between this supportive culture and availability of work family benefits and they found that the informal culture was much more important was a stronger predictor of employee attitudes than just having formal benefits available so this is hammering home that point that it's much more important that you have a culture or you have an environment that really supports work family than it is to just offer benefits without changing um, the way the way the organization functions or actually thinks about those benefits. So they did a, um, or Karen Linus and her student did a follow-up study to this that, that corroborates that evidence, but this one was done with the 2002 National Study of the Changing Workforce, which is a nationally representative sample, and it's a much larger than in that previous study, the sample in the previous study. 
Um, so what they did here is um, a somewhat complex statistical procedure, but I'll try to talk you through it, called relative weights analysis. And they're interested in predicting specifically work to non-work spillover. So very similar concept to work to um, non-work or work to family conflict. So when you do research, um, what we mean by predicting something is that you would enter into a regression equation, which is statistical um, analysis. You would enter anything that you think matters in predicting this outcome variable, which in this case is the spillover. Um, so you could enter a bunch of different variables and then you would get an equation that would tell you how much each of those predicts where somebody stands on the outcome. So if we know where they stand on the predictor variable, then with what percentage of accuracy can we predict where they stand on the outcome variable? So we never get that to 100%. We're never going to be able to measure everything that would account for 100% of somebody's spillover because there's just too many things happening in life when we're talking about human behavior. Um, but you know we can get up to, and it depends on the variable, but with this um, often somewhere up to like 50%. We can, so we can say if we know where they stand on these 10 variables, we can predict with 50% accuracy where somebody is likely to stand in terms of how much conflict they have. Okay, So then within that 50% you can predict, you can do what's called a relative weights analysis. So you can say of that 50%, how important is each of those 10 variables that we threw into that equation? So that's what Grotto and Linus did. So another way to think about it is looking at it like a pie. So I'll show you this in a pie chart. And the bigger the piece of pie, that means the more important that variable is in predicting spillover. So the more we know about that variable, the more that increases our accuracy in the ultimate prediction. So you can, we'll start with the bolded variables here. So flexible work arrangement availability, that's a really tiny slice of the pie, only 2.5%. So what that means is that if you know where somebody stands and how much flexibility they have available, if you know that information, that helps you, it increases your accuracy with which you'd predict their spillover level with about 2.5%. So not, not really doing too much for us in the grand scheme of things. On the other hand, if you look at these two measures of the informal um, environment, we have work-life supportive supervisor and work-life career support. So these aren't exactly the same as the Thompson et al. culture idea, but they're pretty similar. So how supportive is your supervisor for work-life issues? That aligns very well with that managerial support component. And then work-life career support gets at you know, how much is your career likely to be damaged for you talking about work-life issues or trying to um, use available benefits. So if we combine the 10%, 11.4% of those, that's 21.4%. So it means it's close to 10 times more predictive, more important in predicting spillover than the formal benefit availability. So that echoes the findings of the previous study as well. The thing I think is really interesting in this graph is look at the strain-based job demands. That's, that's accounting for almost 50%. And that's things like um, how much pressure you get from your boss to get your job done, how stressful your job is, maybe how um, just emotionally demanding it is. So that's in contrast to time-based job demands, which are simply like how often you have to be at work. This is more just thinking about how stressful is your job, sort of how much does it require of you. So that's what seems to matter the most in predicting spillover. Um, and that's not something that's talked about very much in the research. It's like, instead of trying to offer all these benefits or having a supportive supervisor, maybe we should think about the nature of the work that we're requiring of people and the type of stress that we're putting on them. And some of it may be people putting it on themselves, but I think a lot of it is just the way that organizations um, are structured in a way that they communicate expectations to people where it, it sort of feels like if I don't do this, you know, the world's going to come crumbling down. If I don't get that TPS report done. Um, and, and there's just not a lot of discussion about that, which I, I think might be a huge miss in, in our trying to understand what we can do to help people's work-life management. Okay, so pretty compelling cases here for the importance of the informal environment. So I want to talk about a little bit of a different variant on this, which is a shift from thinking about overall support perceptions or culture to specific behaviors. Um, and also the shift is that this, this construct, which is known as family supportive supervisor behaviors, which was put forth by Hammer and her colleagues, they've done a lot of additional work on this in the past couple of years. Um, you notice that it focuses on the supervisor. So the early work saying it matters how important you, it, it matters on the broader organizational level. Um, and then this work, Hammer and colleagues first said, yeah, but if you look at the data, the manager, the manager or the direct supervisor is a huge part of it. So you could have an organization that's great. Let's say you worked at um, uh, Zappos, right? 
and but your immediate boss is kind of a jerk right and isn't willing to let you have any flexibility even if it's supposed to be available is really just not understanding then that's going to be the thing you notice the most because your immediate boss has the most control over um your job security essentially right and has the most is the most closely supervising you so um they argued that really the meat of this is at the managerial level and we should focus on behaviors right because those are things that are more observable and that potentially we can actually change so they did some qualitative research to try to understand you know what kind of behaviors do reflect a truly um, family supportive boss and they came up with four buckets and these behaviors were mentioned in the classic reading um, but I'll go over them a little bit more and give you some examples here too. The first is emotional support. So example of this is you know, how supportive just like generally is your boss? Do they listen to you? Are they willing to hear you out? Do they express understanding? Are they really stern and, and never budging um, and never really acting like they care or understand? The second is role modeling. Okay, so this could come in the form of something just like a boss willing to talk about work family issues, so communicating like, I care about these things, I'm going to be a role model that it's okay to care about those. Or it could come in even more extreme forms. I think a, a really good example is Sheryl Sandberg. So she's known for, she leaves um, Facebook every day at 5.30, so she can have dinner with her family at home at 6.00. Um, now she continues working later on, but she shows her employees like visibly and she, she talks about how this is something she struggles with that she used to try to do it in a more sneaky way, but now she's very apparent. She lets people know she is leaving for family purposes. So that's role modeling to others that that is something that matters. Then you have the daily job and personal problem solving. So this is sometimes also called the instrumental support component. So beyond just being there and being willing to listen, as a supervisor, are you willing to do things that are problem solving things? So are you willing to take action and say perhaps, okay, I'll switch your shift so that you can make your kids soccer game on Saturday. So this is, is actual tangible behaviors. Not that emotional support is not a behavior, um, but it's not things that are actually going to get things done and solve the problem directly. And the last one's a little bit more of a vague concept, but they label it creative work family management. So here the idea is that you're just thinking outside the box. So supervisors are willing to um, say, okay, let me work with you. Let's get creative here. Um, let's not feel like we're we have to conform to the few I ideas we've done in the past. What can we do that's different and unique to solve your specific work family issues? Okay. What's really neat about this is it's something that's amenable to training. Okay, so you can train people to be more supportive. So this is very actionable in that sense. So Hammer and colleagues have developed this uh, multi-step training program. Um, the first step is computer-based. So this is where you walk through something very much like what you're watching right now. You have PowerPoint slides, they explain what family supportive supervisor behaviors are, why they're important, they show some of the research that this team has done to show um, you know, the higher perceptions of supportive supervisors' behaviors people have, the more likely they are to be happy at work and to not turn over and to perform better. You know, they, they kind of sell the idea in this training. Um, another really important part of it is that before the training happens, they typically go into the organization and administer surveys. So they ask the subordinates, okay, rank how supportive you see your supervisor as, and then they also ask the supervisor, fill out the scale about yourself. Well, lo and behold, perhaps not surprisingly, there's always a gap. Supervisors always think they're more supportive than their subordinates think they are. So you can show with data that gap and say, hey, look, you think you're doing this, but your employees aren't picking up on that. So there's a need for this training. So I think anytime you can argue with data like that, it's really quite powerful. The next part is a face-to-face role-playing exercise. So the trainer will take, um, assume the role of a subordinate who comes to the supervisor with a problem and then the supervisor has to react and the trainer gives them feedback like what you said right there this wasn't the best because x y and z so think about this as is very similar to the veterans um, training that i showed you the families of heroes training um, it would be very cool if they could get this adaptive like that whereas you picked a choice and then um, you know it kind of that choice set you down on a path and you could really see kind of where you went wrong and very adaptive in that sense. Um, I think this would be very well suited to that, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, they don't have that sophisticated of technology, but they do do these face-to-face -face, um, role-playing exercises with a trainer. 
And then finally, the third part is called behavioral self-monitoring. So the supervisors are given a, a card that they walk around with that they're supposed to, that has a list of different types of behaviors and they're supposed to check off throughout the day or throughout you know, several weeks how often they gauge in um, various FSSBs. Um, and sometimes as a part of this, they'll set goals. Um, so you know, it makes it a little bit more achievable and tangible in terms of how many behaviors should they be engaging in. Uh, and in some of their studies, they've looked at then the behavioral self-monitoring before and after the training intervention. So then you can really have concrete um, data on the change and, and how much this training intervention actually does work. Um, oh, getting a little head there. So I wanna show you this video um, that I think makes some of the ideas I just talked about a little bit more concrete. Tina Burgess worked part-time at the Family Fair grocery store in Byron Center, Michigan for 15 years. She was offered a full-time job, but it started at 5 a.m. I said, I'm interested in the full-time position, but if I'm going to do the full-time position, there's a few little things, you know, and I just explained to her that I felt that I needed to be home. As I talked to her about it, that's when she explained to me, you know, I need to still go home and get my kids off to school. And as we talked about it in detail, I told her I don't think there's any reason why we can't work this out somehow. They did work it out, and Burgess took the full-time job. Hey, Aaron, it's me. Time to wake up, okay? Okay, bye. Scheduling flexibility is something Stackowitz and other managers learned through an intervention program that teaches family-supportive supervisor behaviors. We went into 12 stores across Michigan and Ohio, and in half the stores, uh, the managers were trained, and half the stores, they were not. We gave supervisors, there were actually cards that contained days where they had to keep track of the number of family supportive supervisor behaviors they engaged in, and these involved interactions with employees. It's basically a program we did for three weeks, and we kept track of how many times we talked to associate, how many times we asked about their family, or the younger kids, how, you know, sports type things, what they do after school. Hi, Cindy. How's it going? Good. Good. Stackowitz felt she was already a supportive manager, but keeping track of her interactions helped her improve even more. I see the difference in these associates. Once you give them the freedom to know that they can come in and talk and not just come to work and do their job and, and keep everything inside, um, it helps. In the six stores where managers received training, the employees reported substantial changes. It improved their physical health. It improved their reports of general supervisor support. It improved their reports of job satisfaction, so job satisfaction increase, and turnover intentions. The intention to leave the company decreased. We learned that small changes to help managers learn how to manage work family issues have big payoffs for companies. For Tina Burgess, flexibility made all the difference. Yeah, I get to leave the store every morning, usually about 7.15, 7.20, and I just come home quick and um, make sure my kids are up and make their lunch. Burgess is away for less than an hour. The store has trained other employees to fill in while she's gone. All right, have a good day. See you when you get home. Love ya. The store managers found the cooperation goes both ways. With her knowing that we've accommodated her in her situation, there are times when people are on vacation and she's willing to step up and help me out and go out of her availability because of the flexibility. If they're going to give me that time to be able to go home, I'm going to give them more of my time. This pilot study was so successful, the Work Family and Health Network has started a new study to measure whether this type of training will work in other industries. I'm Mary Sawyers reporting. Okay, so you can see that's a, a really prime example of um, the creative work family management um, dimension.
I wanted to just show you some data to talk a little more specifically about the benefits of this training. Um, so when you compare control groups where supervisors don't undergo the training to those that do within the same organizations, um, those who do undergo the training, uh, their subordinates report that their supervisors are more supportive. They report feeling that they have more control over work time. Um, it also affects areas sort of you wouldn't see the immediate connection. Um, people are more safety compliant and they also exhibit more organizational citizenship behavior. So those are things like going the extra mile for your job, so staying late to help um, when you're needed, um, uh, helping an employee maybe with something she's struggling with, taking out the trash, volunteering to, to coordinate the party, those kind of things. Um, so that ties back into the idea we mentioned before about just this feeling supported. When you feel your organization cares about you, you want to reciprocate in meaningful ways. Um, what's really interesting about this, though, is in at least two of their studies, um, they have not found that it impacts work-family conflict. So just like formal benefits, having a more supervisor, uh, family supportive supervisor doesn't impact work-family conflict. It doesn't hurt it, but you're not seeing a significant reduction in it. Um, so it may just be that people have high conflict a lot of it stems from the nature of their family demands and there's nothing you can do on the work side that's really going to greatly eliminate that that's just a hypothesis i don't really know but nonetheless it's still important for um some other some other areas of work that are generally important for overall well-being too I wanted to touch on a few key takeaways that I um, see as important from the Cossack et al. reading about uh, work, family, and health change initiatives. I think that their table on page 55 is, is particularly salient, table one, in terms of thinking about. So if you do want to go in an organization and you do want to try to have some very targeted intervention to make changes, there's important things to think about. So this is one very specific type of intervention. And I think this is this concept of making change is something that you may be able to use in your own organizational life outside of the work family context. That's why I think it's really important to talk about. You know, when you're coming up with an intervention, you want to have what they call theoretically based intervention ingredients. So they, as I mentioned, drew from the literature before showing that the manager is really the key important part of things. Um, so that's where that the focus on the manager stemmed from, and then they used um, qualitative research to really get a better grasp on what these behaviors looked like. Um, so you, you want to make sure this is kind of common sense, but if you're doing an intervention that is grounded in good science in terms of it makes sense, that it's going to have the outcomes that you want it to have. And any time you create an intervention, even if it's much, sm much smaller in scope than this one, you do want to do a pilot study. So pilot studies are just running the intervention with a smaller group of people. So before you launch anything, any type of study, you should always test it on a smaller group because that can help you work out the kinks. There may be stuff you didn't even realize that's not functioning correctly or that's confusing to participants. And that can really help build not only a better product, but it may point out things you had just never thought of. And that goes without saying you should always use evidence-based research findings, okay? So not only is that just compelling when you're trying to convince people to buy into your intervention, but, you know, it's important to be basing what you're doing off of data. So if you develop this intervention and it doesn't change anything, you know, in the pilot, well, that's maybe grounds to say, well, either this doesn't work in the same way we thought it would from a theoretical standpoint, or we need to figure out why it's not having that impact and what we can change. Um, so you should do a lot of testing before, as much as you can, before broadly implementing anything to make sure that it does, it does have at least some of the intended impacts. They argue for the advantage of interdisciplinary design teams, meaning that you don't want to have people who are just all, for instance, like I am an industrial organizational psychologist who are very, think in a, a probably very similar way. So on their team, they have people who are sociologists, people who are in health psychology, they have some... Um, uh, medical doctors, so because they have a big health component that we haven't really touched on much um, in this lecture, but at any rate, they they really argue for why that that helps make um, helps you to see all sides of things and ultimately again have a better product. Anytime you want to do something like this, you have to have to have to have buy-in from top management, or it just absolutely will not work. That's the case with with many things in organizations. And as I said before, I think a good way to do that is to argue with data. 
And then finally, you want interventions to have some aspect where they can be customizable um, to the specific organizational context. So um, I know in, in this Work, Family, and Health Network study that we've been talking about with Hammer and colleagues, they, they've done this in grocery stores, they've done this in um, some factory workers, they've done this in some more corporate type jobs with IT workers. And it hasn't been identical for all of them because some of the behaviors and some of the work family concerns are going to be different for those type of populations, right? Grocery workers um, on the floor have shifts. Somebody has to be there to man the cash register. That's a little bit different for more of a corporate environment. Um, you know, so customizing things would help it have the broadest appeal if you're, if you're trying to do something outside of just your organization. Okay, so that brings me to discussion question three. Now, this is going to be a bit heavier than your typical discussion question. This is an activity that I had us uh, plan for us to do in class. So what I want you to do um, now, as I said in my uh, comments to you on Blackboard, I had originally posted an organizational case today that was just one of these cases, um, but I think switching to this online lecture, I need to change the format a little bit. So my apologies if you already read that. It was only two pages, so it shouldn't have taken up too much of your time. But I've posted another document that's that's longer and it has five case studies within it so I've assigned each of you just randomly put you in different groups and that's going to show you which case you should focus on so you don't need to read the whole thing you only need to read the case that's assigned to you and then oh, let me pull up the the document here okay so right Let's start, you can see the first case. Case one. So if you were assigned to this one, you would read through this. Each one's just a couple pages. And then you can see the discussion questions. So on the discussion board, then I want you, if, just if you were assigned to that group, to answer those four questions. Okay? And when you go back through and you're responding on other people's comments, it's probably a good idea to look for your other group members and respond on theirs in this discussion board question. Okay, so all of them have you know, four discussion questions. Okay. So I want you to answer all four of the discussion questions within your answer to discussion board question number three. So it's not just picking one, it's answering all four of them. Um, so this, this question is probably going to be a little bit longer um, than the others. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about is a little bit of a shift, and um, it's something I've been, I've had sort of prepared in each of our last couple lectures, and then it didn't really fit with the time, so I want to make sure we don't miss this video. I know there's been a lot of videos in this lecture, which hopefully you don't mind, uh, but I think it's a really, a really neat TED Talk, and it's 10 minutes, so it's a little bit shorter than your typical TED Talk, but I, I want us to watch this. Essentially, the argument here is, is shifting away from organizational initiatives, but really asking, what about the personal responsibility that we all should take on for this? So maybe it's not even the organization's role to do anything for us. Maybe it's, it's in our own hands. What I thought I would do is I would start with a, a simple request. Uh, I'd like all of you to, to pause for a moment, you wretched weaklings, uh, and take stock of your miserable existence. <laughs> now, that was the advice that St. Benedict gave his rather startled followers uh, in the 5th century. Uh, it was the advice that I decided to follow myself when I turned 40. Up until that moment, I had been that classic corporate warrior. I was eating too much, I was drinking too much, I was working too hard, and I was neglecting the family. Uh, and I decided that I would try and turn my life around. In particular, I decided I would try to address the thorny issue of work-life balance. So I, I stepped back from the workforce, and I spent a year at home with my wife and four young children. But all I learned about work-life balance from that year was that I found it quite easy to balance work and life when I didn't have any work. <laughs> Not a very useful skill, uh, especially when the, when the money runs out. Um, so I went back to work, and I'd spent 
the seven years since, struggling with, studying and writing about work-life balance. Uh, I have four observations I'd like to share with you uh, today. The first is if society is to make any progress on this issue, we, we need an honest debate. But the trouble is, so many people talk so much rubbish about work-life balance. All the discussions about flexi time, or dress down Fridays, or paternity leave, only serve to mask the core issue, which is that certain job and career choices are fundamentally incompatible with being meaningfully engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with a young family. Now the first step in solving any problem is acknowledging the reality of the situation you're in. And the reality of the society that we're in is there are thousands and thousands of people out there leading lives of quiet, screaming desperation, where they work long, hard hours at jobs they hate to enable them to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> And it's my contention that going to work on a Friday in jeans and t-shirt isn't really getting to the nub of the issue. <laughs> the second observation I'd like to make is we need to face the truth that governments and corporations aren't going to solve this issue for us. We should stop looking outside. It's up to us as individuals to take control and responsibility for the type of lives that we want to lead. If you don't design your life, someone else will design it for you, and you may just not like their idea of balance. It's particularly important, this isn't on the World Wide Web, is it? I'm about to get fired. It's particularly important that you never put the quality of your life in the hands of a commercial corporation. Now, I'm not talking here just about the bad companies, the, the abattoirs of the human soul, as I call them. <laughs> I'm talking about all companies, because commercial companies are inherently designed to get as much out of you as they can get away with. It's in their nature, it's in their DNA, it's what they do, even the good, well-intentioned companies. On the one hand, putting childcare facilities in the workplace is wonderful and enlightened. On the other hand, it's a nightmare that just means you spend more time at the bloody office. We have to be responsible for setting and enforcing the boundaries that we want in our life. The third observation is we have to be careful with the time frame that we choose upon which to judge our balance. Before I went back to work, after my year at home, I, I sat down and I wrote out a detailed step-by-step -step description of the ideal balanced day that I aspired to. And it went like this. Wake up well rested after a good night's sleep. Have sex. <laughs> Walk the dog. Have breakfast with my wife and children. Have sex again. <laughs> Drive the kids to school on the way to the office. Do three hours work, play sport with a friend at lunchtime. Do another three hours work. Meet some mates in the pub for an early evening drink. Drive home for dinner with my wife and kids. Meditate for half an hour. Have sex. Walk the dog. Have sex again. Go to bed. How often do you think I had that day? <laughs> uh, we, we need to be realistic. You can't do it all in one day. We need to elongate the time frame upon which we judge the balance in our life. But we need to elongate it without falling into the trap of the I'll have a life when I retire. When my kids have left home, when my wife has divorced me, my health is failing, I've got no mates or interests left. A day is too short, after I retire is too long. There's got to be a middle way. 
The fourth observation, we need to approach balance in a balanced way. A friend came to see me last year, and she doesn't mind me telling the story. Uh, a friend came to see me last year and said, Nigel, I've read your book, and I realised that my life is completely out of balance. It's totally dominated by work. I work 10 hours a day, I commute 2 hours a day. All my relationships have failed. There's nothing in my life apart from my work. So I've decided to get a grip and sort it out. So I joined a gym. <laughs> Now, I don't mean to mock, but being a fit 10 hour a day office rat isn't more balanced, it's more fit. <laughs> Lovely, though physical exercise may be, there are other parts to life. There's the intellectual side, there's the emotional side, there's the spiritual side. And to be balanced, I believe we have to attend to all of those areas, not just do 50 stomach crunches. Now, that can be daunting, because people say, bloody hell, mate, I haven't got time to get fit. You want me to go to church and call my mother? <laughs> and I understand, I, I truly understand how that can be daunting. But an incident that happened a couple of years ago gave me a new perspective. My wife, who is somewhere in the audience uh, today, called me up at the office and said, Nigel, you need to pick our younger son up, Harry, from school. She had to be somewhere else with the other three children for that evening. So I left work an hour early that afternoon and picked Harry up at the school gates. We walked down to the local park, messed around on the swings, played some silly games. I then walked him up the hill to the local cafe and we shared a pizza for tea. Then walked down the hill to our home uh, and I gave him his bath and put him in his Batman pajamas. I then read him a chapter of Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach. I then put him to bed, tucked him in, gave him a kiss on his forehead and said, good night, mate, and walked out of his bedroom. As I was walking out of his bedroom, he said, Dad, uh, yes, mate, he went, Dad, this has been the best day of my life, <laughs> ever. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't taken him to Disney World or bought him a PlayStation. Now my point is, the small things matter. Being more balanced doesn't mean dramatic upheaval in your life. With the smallest investment in the right places, you can radically transform the quality of your relationships and the quality of your life. Moreover, I think it can transform society. Because if enough people do it, we can change society's definition of success away from the moronically simplistic notion that the person with the most money when he dies wins, to a more thoughtful and balanced definition of what a life well lived looks like. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. Okay. So I really look forward to to hearing your thoughts on this um, and that's basically what discussion question four is just to describe your reaction your thoughts your comments um, you know anything that stood out to you about that video in the past when we've talked about this in class people have always have seemed to have a strong reaction to it so hopefully you have as well okay so that's the end of this lecture I will see you in class on November 30th and um, if, again, if you haven't started reading Lean In, you should go ahead and start on that because we'll be talking about that on our last class extensively, which is December 7th. Um, 